So as I said, we are going to look at, first of all, is there end-to-end -end connectivity? And as and I said, if it's there, we're done. There's no reason for us, unless there's some sort of intermittent problem. And that'll be a different story. But if there is connectivity, there's nothing here for us to troubleshoot. I'm going to assume that somebody opened up some sort of trouble ticket and said, hey, we've got a problem. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, perhaps, doing the verification of end-to-end -end connectivity. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of uh, very common tools that can be run both from the PC, from the switch, or even from the router that we can use to help verify that we have connectivity. Remember the OSI model. And in the OSI model, we had the layer one, which was the physical connection, the wires. I like to even ask the question, did you check to make sure the wires are plugged in? The switches generally work at layer two. That's where Ethernet is. Layer three is where we're working with the routers, maybe routing protocols. Layer four is our transport layer. And that, uh, the transport layer, that's where we have the language that both sides speak. So when a, a problem is reported, it might be any one of these issues. If I sim simply said, look, this is my web server. I can't open up the web page. All right, it could be a physical wire. It could be a problem with the switch, not knowing how to get me to my gateway. It could be a problem with the router, not having a route or a path that I can use to get to that web server. It could be that the web server is speaking some sort of foreign language that's not at the transport layer that's uh, causing me issues, or anything else all the way up at layer 7 where we have the applications. And one approach to troubleshooting is called to uh, verify everything by the layers. That means you could uh, start at layer 1 and move up to test everything, or start at layer 7 and move down. Another option is called sometimes divide and conquer. Divide and conquer says, hey, let's start at one point, and depending on the results of my test, I'll move up or down this OSI model to do my troubleshooting. I'm not going to tell you which is the best or the worst if the, because it's a matter of how you process the information and what seems to be easiest for you, plus, of course, over time, you're going to have a better understanding about what some of the past problems have been in your network, and that might also lead you to your strategy of how to troubleshoot. One of the most common commands is the ping command. And I want you to notice we're actually doing this from the Windows machine. Now, ping falls under uh, a protocol called ICMP, the Internet Control Message Protocol. And there's a number of different types of messages. Uh, it, I think I mentioned this maybe in uh, some of the other courses, that some people said that ping stood for Packet Internet Groper. I look at it more like the sonar you see in the uh, submarine movies where we send out that... Uh, uh, basically uh, audio wave, uh, sound wave, and it bounces off of something metal like another submarine and comes back to us. Plus, we can also figure out how far away they are based on how quickly it comes back to us. And so that's kind of what ping is to me. It's like that sonar. But it actually has two components to doing ping. One is called the echo request. That's my sending out that uh, sound wave. And then the reply coming back, which is the echo reply. So in this case, Windows is uh, pinging the uh, far end web server. They're sending an echo request. Assuming that uh, the traffic makes it all the way to the endpoint and that the server is uh, allowed to do echo replies, then we would start seeing these replies. As a side note as well, when we see the reply, we then have basically verified, well, did we verify end-to-end -end connectivity? No, we verified IP to IP connectivity. We still don't know if the application is working. Maybe they've misconfigured the web server and it's not running on the same port. So remember, that's why we look at the layers. But we're identifying at least a layer three that we have connectivity. And the other thing I look for is this time that it takes for this traffic to come back. The time should always be very fast on a local area network. Uh, if you start seeing these things get into the uh, high tens to the hundreds of milliseconds, I'm thinking you've got some other problems, usually with a bottleneck in traffic somewhere, because uh, on a local network, this reply should be very quick. These packets aren't very big either that we're sending. We could change stuff about them, but uh, anyway, that's another story. So uh, in this case, the first one did take a little bit of time. Why is that? Well, that's, you're going to see the same thing on a Cisco uh, device as well, that the first ping might not even come back or may take a long time, just because uh, if it's a new address that you haven't gone to before, you still have to wait for ARP, the address resolution protocol, to either get you the MAC address of your target 
uh, or somebody else down the road to get the MAC address of your target or for you to get the MAC address of your gateway. I mean, at some point, you could have lots of different devices uh, trying to find the MAC address for that destination IP. And uh, once they have it, then the next ones are fast because it's already stored in the cache. So you can kind of see that here as well. Trace route is a term that we use to see what path that our traffic is going to take. And trace route uses uh, the uh, function at layer three called the time to live, the TTL. And what I want to do is at least explain to you how trace route technically works. And this is again being done from a Windows machine here. So we'll call that Windows A. And somewhere over here we have a server. I called it my web server, so I'll put a big W on it. And uh, we'll see, be a little technical. There's a switch probably that uh, we're going through in this local area network connected to a router. And I'm just use little X's. And I'm going to put a couple more routers in my path than what we had before. And that's just to help better explain how trace route works. All right. So how do I know the path? How does this even work? Well, I'm going to send basically another ICMP message. Uh, and by the way, you can do trace route with uh, different protocols. It's uh, kind of cool that what it does. But here's the idea. I'm going to say, okay, look, I need to uh, do a trace. So I'm going to send my trace to 172.16.1, let's see, 1.100. All right. So there I'm going to set it up. So I send my packet in to that first router. Why does it tell me or even bother to tell me that uh, it received the packet? Well, here's what technically happened. That first packet I sent, I set the TTL equal to 1. And every time a packet goes through a router, the TTL is going to be decreased by a count of 1. The maximum, by the way, the TTL can be is 255. It's an 8-bit field. So the router receives it and it subtracts 1 from the TTL. That makes the TTL now 0. When a TTL is 0, the router is not allowed to continue to forward the traffic because uh, it's already at its maximum age. And so the router sends me back this uh, basic uh, timed out message saying that it had to kill the packet because it was already uh, dead, uh, basically on arrival. And it reports to me its IP address that it uh, sent me the message from. So now I'm going to send my second packet. My second packet has a TTL of equal to 2. So I get to the first router, it subtracts 1. Now my TTL is 1. It goes to the next router, it subtracts 1. Guess what? I'm now down to 0. The second router responds to me, tells me its IP address and the message that it timed out. Then I send a third packet with my TTL, you probably guessed it, 3. Hits the first router again, subtracts 1. Hits the second router, subtracts 1. Gets to the third router, subtracts 1, that becomes 0, and you see this pattern, right? That I'm getting the messages back. Now, unfortunately, I drew one too many routers, so let's pretend that we had uh, another one, and um, we'll just uh, keep uh, adding some things to it. And uh, I don't know what uh, address to make it. Uh, let's see. Well, I've already reached it, but you get the idea. I'm just going to put a fake address in. Uh, anyway, so then I just keep doing that to, uh, on the TTLs, and at some point, right, I'm going to get to uh, that last router who can then finally uh, show me uh, the reply or give me a reply from that device. So again, the TTL is going to be ever increasing. You notice that I keep increasing it by one with each of those. So what that's done now is it has shown me which routers that were touched in the path of the traffic that I used to be able to get from where I started to where I want to go. And that's what uh, the trace route does. I hope I also mentioned that ping can be done from your switches or from your routers, as well as the trace route command. They're the same concepts. It's just being done from a different part of the network, which might also be useful if you don't have access to the computer that may be reporting the particular problem. Now, one of the other things to think about with ping, and I'm just going to put this from a perspective of, uh, you know, you're doing this from the PC. If you have a user who pretty much knows what they're doing, they may have already done a ping test for you. Made a much smaller network now. And, uh, and so technically what we've always told people is that the first ping should be to yourself. Uh, and that could be to your IP address or to your own loopback interface. 
Uh, that's, uh, by the way, the IP address for the loopback, or it could be to uh, your configured IP address. And the purpose of pinging yourself is just to make sure your network card is up and that maybe the drivers that are making it talk to Windows are working properly, uh, just so that you have the basic configuration. And then we always told people you should then uh, ping your gateway. So the next ping would be to that gateway address here. Now, some people might say ping somebody else on the local network, maybe because you're just testing to see if the switch is a problem. But I kind of think that if you ping the uh, gateway address, that's also on the local network. So you're kind of killing both uh, ideas with one test, which is great. So we're getting through the switch, then we get to the gateway. And then the third part, of course, is to uh, ping a, uh, a next top host. That means, you know, you could then try to just ping all the way through to the web server if you want to knowing that your gateway is good, or if you're doing this network troubleshooting, you might want to just ping all the hops uh, that you have and see where the potential for the break might be. And, uh, and again, that's just kind of a strategy that you could uh, impose when you're doing your pings, even from your own switches. So I've already said that our testing of ping and trace route is an IP connectivity. It's uh, not doing anything for us to uh, let us know if there's some other potential problem. Maybe it could be at the application layer like Telnet. So when we uh, see commands um, or want to test out connectivity, we might try something like doing a Telnet or other application to connect to that far end uh, IP address. And if we get a message back, something like that says open, then at least we know that we're getting through at the transport layer to that different device. But that's not always going to be helpful because Telnet uses port 23 and many servers may not even have that port open. But if it was a web server, I could always try to Telnet to uh, its web server's port, port 80. And, uh, and of course, that also means that somebody would have to configure the server to listen to that so that it could respond with an open if you did make it. Now, again, that's not always going to help. You might try to tell that to port 25, which is your email's uh, SMTP server settings. Um, and if you see connection refused by host, it doesn't mean that it's not working. Uh, it just kind of means that maybe somebody didn't allow uh, Telnet on an email port. Um, but again, you're just trying to look at other ways to test the application layer of what it is that you're doing when you're having or trying to begin to troubleshoot the end-to-end uh, -end connectivity. One of the great benefits, I said, of uh, doing uh, the uh, little settings, I said, ping yourself first, and then uh, going through your switch, try to ping your gateway, and uh, then move on from there. Uh, because in this segment here, we're dealing with layer two, which is all about MAC addresses. And so one of the things you want to take a look at when you're trying to uh, verify connectivity is what MAC address might you be using, let's say, for your gateway? Is that something you dynamically learned, which it probably is through ARP? And then you can verify, is that the actual MAC address that's assigned to that gateway? Now, if it is the correct MAC address, then it might be that there's a problem here at layer two with the switch, not knowing which port to actually forward the traffic out of. But again, we're just uh, using a tool called ARP on the uh, host PC. And if the ARP, by the way, if the uh, whole thing is, is bad, you can do an ARP with a space dash D, and that would clear all of those dynamic entries so you could relearn the MAC addresses in case it was wrong. Uh, but, uh, and we can do something similar to that on the switch as well. So here you can see on the switch that we also have the show MAC address table. Now remember that a switch, when it receives any type of frame at layer two, the traffic comes in, it's going to look up the destination MAC address, and it's going to go through this table here and look to see if it has a matching destination MAC address. Oh, look, here we found that same one. Dynamically learned, and it says outbound is port 13. Port 13 would be the port, hopefully, that we would use to get over here to the router. And, uh, and if that's not correct, then that's where you might, again, clear this one's MAC address table so the switch could relearn the address, the appropriate interface for the destination um, router that it wants to get to. Or at least look to see if it was something that was statically entered, uh, which means that no matter uh, where you move the router, switch won't care. It's just going to keep forwarding traffic out potentially the wrong port.